John, thank you for joining us today. Now, governments around the world are adopting net zero policies that have created opportunities for investors who are shifting away from fossil fuels. The adoption of electric vehicles continues to accelerate, and this is driving demand for many metals, including lithium. Now, Sprott offers products for investors to capitalize off this energy transition trend. Can you tell us a bit about them? Yeah, we've, uh, we've definitely, in the last uh, two and a half years, Notice there is a growing trend amongst uh, investors globally around playing this long-term thematic around energy transition. And the energy transition in our minds is really about generating cleaner energy from different technologies. It's about the transmission of that energy and electrification. And lastly, it's about energy storage, which is just another way of saying batteries, uh, pr predominantly for electric vehicles. So. The world is, is clearly focused on generating cleaner energy to decarbonize economies and lower greenhouse gas emissions with the hope of achieving net zero targets uh, out in 2050, uh, which is all designed obviously to bring the Earth's temperature down. When we talk to investors, it's, it's very clear they're starting to understand that this transition is going to be incredibly mineral intense. So it's, it's very different than, than the fossil fuel based systems, which are more about liquids and gases. Um, the energy transition will, will require a lot of minerals. And many of these minerals are critical in nature because they're, not, uh, they're, they're relatively new in terms of their development. I think lithium is the, great, the greatest example. It's a very nascent industry. And prior to the adoption of electric vehicles, we really didn't use lithium for a whole lot of things. So lithium is the one a common element across every single battery chemistry for electric vehicles and as a result with the expect expected adoption of EVs over the coming decades uh, we will need substantially more lithium and there is a real lithium race going on right now to secure the necessary supplies so that it doesn't become a, a bottleneck in the supply chain so um, we think it's a, a multi-decade transition it's not going to replace fossil fuels anytime soon, but I think the world, as it adds more energy capacity, uh, is increasingly focused on making investments in cleaner technologies. And you guys have um, three different products, uh, the Energy Transition Materials ETF, the Lithium Miners ETF, and the Copper ETF. Can you talk to me about the interest you've seen among investors in these products and maybe the flows you're seeing into these products? Yeah, sure. Uh, well, ETFs, I think, are very popular um, vehicles for investors to get exposure to different thematics. Uh, and I think the reason is pretty simple. And for the average investor, um, it's I think it's overwhelming for them to sit down and think about, okay, I like the long-term prospects of this particular metal. How do I go about investing in it? Do I pick one or two companies? Or do I buy, do I try to get exposure to the physical commodity if I can? Uh, or do I buy a basket of different companies, you know, all packaged up for me within an ETF, which is very easy to buy, low cost of ownership, very transparent. Um, and that's really the path that we've taken with a, a number of our product, uh, recent product offerings. We've taken our knowledge and expertise in, in uh, metals and mining, and we've worked with different service providers, uh, one of them being NASDAQ. Uh, their index group, where we basically work on the development of the investment universe, which is very important. What we find with a lot of investors is they want the pure play exposure to a thematic, um, and, and it's very hard for them sometimes to get it because with a lot of these diversified mining companies, for example, you might think you're getting exposure, let's say, to copper, but in reality, most of the revenue at that company coming from iron ore or coal. So we really look company by company to figure out what is its role in this energy transition thematic, what exposures does it provide to investors? So we start with the uh, investment universe, uh, defining that to really become as pure play as possible. Um, second of all, we're constantly scanning the landscape for new companies, spin-offs, IPOs. Obviously, companies are changing their business mix and their strategies all the time. So when we develop our indexes, it's not a static process. Every six months, we basically look at the entire investment universe from scratch, try to figure out how these companies have changed, which companies have come and gone. Uh, we basically rebalance the index with new constituents. So it's a very dynamic process. And I think our expertise as active managers, uh, you know, integrating that into, the, into a passive approach and making it, uh, making it dynamic over time, I think is what investors uh, are, are interested in from, from, from our suite of products. 
For sure. And, and you guys have a lot of different metals to choose from, but I want to focus in on copper. You know, a traditional gas car uses about 50 pounds of copper, but an electric vehicle uses 150 pounds, and that's helped copper hang in relatively well this year. Uh, Sprott, as you said, has an ETF focused on copper. Can you walk us through that? Yeah, copper, I think, is going to play a really large role in the energy transition for, for two reasons. One, it's really the backbone of electrification. So if the world wants to continue to electrify different, uh, you know, daily uh, things that we use in our lives or industrial processes, transportation, uh, copper is going to be a key part of energy gen generation as well as uh, transportation. So copper, I think, is, is going to be the, the, the real backbone and workhorse of, of the energy transition. Copper, obviously, we've been mining for thousands of years. We understand copper. It's a very large market, almost $200 billion a year but it needs to grow uh, substantially over the next 20 years. We, we need to grow the copper production somewhere between, let's say 50 and 80%, uh, which is a pretty daunting task given how big the industry already is. And so what we've done at Sprott is designed the Sprott Junior Copper Miners ETF. Uh, the ticker on that is COPJ. It's really designed uh, to give you exposure to a broad basket of companies that are uh, smaller producers, emerging developers and exploration companies. There's also been a lot of M&A activity in the space. And the reason for that is everyone is viewing copper as a strategic mineral now. Everything from the big diversified mining companies down to the you know gold, traditional gold companies like Barrick Gold, which have been very open about their viewing copper as a strategic metal for the coming decades. So we've seen a lot of M&A activity in that space. I think the majors, you know, if they find high quality projects in, in good jurisdictions, they're very keen to buy those projects and, and ultimately build them or expand them, then you know, continue to, to, uh, to develop new projects from scratch, given the very long lead times for some of these projects. So it's a very interesting way to, to gain exposure uh, to this to this to this, to this space. Now, another component of the energy transition movement is nuclear energy. According to the World Nuclear Association, there are 440 nuclear reactors operating globally with another 60 under construction, and this is driving demand for uranium. Uh, Sprott's most successful energy transition project is the Sprott Physical Uranium Trust product. A, a lot of retail investors follow you guys specifically for uranium. Why do you think that fund has been so successful? Yeah, I mean, we, uh, I was, I was first start off by saying we totally uh, embrace this idea that nuclear energy is part of the energy transition. We felt that way from day one. It's, it's very um, reassuring that a number of governments around the world have publicly acknowledged a similar policy in the last couple of years as they, they are shifting back to nuclear energy uh, for a few reasons. One, provides a very low carbon footprint. It provides incredibly reliable base load power. Uh, and three, provides energy security. And uh, unfortunately, in the last year and a half, we've learned what happens when a, when a, when a country does not have secure uh, supply of its own energy. It is at the mercy of sometimes uh, aggressive nations and weaponization of commodities. So this, the narrative and the perspective and the public support for nuclear energy has changed enormously uh, since COP26, I would say, which is, which is just uh, two years ago. Um, that is obviously attracting a lot of interest in, in uranium because it is the primary fuel that is going to power not just uh, the existing uh, fleet of nuclear reactors that you mentioned, but for the, let's call another 150 reactors that are in different stages of construction and or planning. So we've got a very uh, constructive long-term demand profile for, for uranium. Against that, we have a very large looming deficit of primary production of uranium because for so many years we had prices that were so low uh, companies were not incentivized to produce uranium they weren't incentivized to develop their projects they had no way of financing them and so we've we've lost a lot of time with uh, many new projects so the industry right now is in the process of resetting itself uh, a big part of that reset is higher prices which have allowed a lot of the mines on care and maintenance to come back online. So we've seen mines in Canada, Africa, Australia, uh, the US slowly start to come back online, which is a really great uh, outcome because it's helping a lot of these uranium mining companies. 
Um, and you know, we don't think we're done. We, we think that even though the price has gone from the high 20s per pound to currently about $74 a pound, we, we still don't have incentive pricing to really build some of the key key new mines that are scheduled to be built, we believe, in this cycle. So investors are attracted to that supply-demand dynamic. Uh, and we think that even though the price has more than doubled in the last uh, year and a half, that the price still needs to reach uh, higher levels to, to really deal with this uh, supply deficit that is going to really uh, widen around 2030. And we've seen a lot of wide divergence in performance this year between various metals. As we talked about, you know, uranium is in a bull market, but then if you look at lithium, it's down about 60%. What do you think is driving this divergence in the market or what's your view on that? Yeah, well, we have a very broad basket of different minerals and metals that are playing a role in this transition. And we've built our product suite to allow investors to pick and choose depending on where we are in the cycle. And every commodity has a different uh, different supply and demand fundamentals and as at a different spot in its cycle. Lithium, for example, in 2021 and 2022 was the best performing commodity in the world by far. It went parabolic. The price went from about 20,000 a metric ton all the way to 80,000 a metric ton. Uh, I think most market participants, including ourselves, did not feel that was sustainable uh, because if you look at the cost structure of the industry, it's, it's substantially lower than 80,000 and just a few years ago, um, lithium was at $15,000 a metric ton. So clearly there was a short term uh, bottleneck that, that created incredible pricing uh, pressure on lithium. This year we've had a, a pretty sharp reversal as you mentioned, lithium price is down substantially this year. I think that's really a function of one, it being a nascent industry. It's still, it's still trying to find its way. It's still maturing, you know, when you think about the copper industry, which has been operating for thousands of years, when you think about it, um, the lithium industry is very new. It's still it's still going through its development phase, and I think that makes its supply profile very lumpy. It also um, the demand side is also lumpy because EVs, um, while they've been growing at 35, 40 percent in the last few years, they have slowed a little bit this year. I think part of that is because uh, general economy has been, has been softer around the world. Uh, interest rates have gone up a lot when you think about the cost of, of car ownership. Financing is a key part. Uh, so you have seen a moderation in demand in terms of EVs. Now, are we going to grow uh, still at 25 or 30 percent? Yeah, probably. It's not 40 percent. And so that expectation has clearly taken some of the energy out of the lithium, uh, the lithium price. But I think longer term, there are really great opportunities in lithium space because of all the different minerals that we look at. It's the one that is going to have to grow the fastest in terms of new greenfield production. The M&A activity in the site in the sector has been very good. Um, it really reinforces to us that everyone is trying to get strategically positioned to secure the best assets. So they've got very robust pipelines of, uh, of uh, future production that they can sell to the OEMs. So, yes, it's been bumpy, um, not totally unexpected given the meteoric rise of lithium in, in 21 and 22. It's going to find its it's going to find its footing. I think it's 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 definitely basing here, uh, and the price is still at a good level that the lithium companies can remain very profitable. Interesting. Yeah, definitely a lot of geopolitical considerations to look out for when it comes to the energy transition. But right now, you guys are on the road uh, marketing across North America and Europe your investment products to clients. Is the energy transition a major topic that they're bringing up? What questions are they asking you? Yeah, we've been uh, we've been very busy. I would say the last two years um, talking about this story, and you know, we started off with uranium. It was it was really the the, the beachhead for us in, in this broader category. And, you know, as we were talking to different funds, and I got to tell you, they were mostly in Europe. Um, you know, we were talking about uranium to funds and, the, and I would ask them, what kind of fund do you run? Like, tell me a little bit about your strategy. And we would uh, increasingly find we were stumbling into funds or sleeves or pods at hedge funds or whatever that were focused on energy transition. And, and sometimes they came from traditional energy backgrounds, meaning, they used to be an oil and gas fund uh, or traditional energy or, or had a utility or infrastructure background. 
and they were starting to broaden their 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 area of expertise to include uh, not just uranium but a, a whole host of different uh, renewable energy technologies as well as energy transition technologies and minerals so it really started there and it really got us thinking about okay this is much bigger than we originally thought and I think a lot of investors are, are one they're looking at those signals uh, and they're asking themselves okay if the world is starting to shift from a fossil fuel based system to uh, a, a system that is going to be focused on cleaner technologies um, and it's going to play out for the coming decades this isn't a one or two year fad this is a multi-decade investment how do I how do I take advantage of this so um, we think more and more investors are, are starting to understand um, energy systems, how energy is produced, the, all the critical minerals rely, that, that we rely on for many of these technologies. And I, I would say many investors are doing a, a lot of research in this space. They historically were invested uh, basically downstream. So they were invested, you know, as far as 15, 20 years ago, they were invested in solar and, and uh, solar companies or solar manufacturing or wind. But now they're thinking about the upstream opportunity. Okay, if we're going to build all this downstream capacity, what do we need upstream? And the upstream opportunity, I think, is, is really compelling because at the end of the day, you need these minerals to, to, to build you know, all of this capacity downstream. So I would say there's definitely been a, a shift from upstream investments, uh, excuse me, from downstream to upstream investments. And that's where a lot of these discussions go around all the critical minerals that, uh, that we're going to require. I would definitely also say that we're seeing a broadening of interest, particularly this year, where we're seeing more generalist investors reaching out to us that are interested in some of these thematics. Uh, it's just too hard to ignore. You know, they're just becoming more and more mainstream. They're in the media every day. Um, if you think about five years ago, owning an electric car, that was for a very privileged few. Now you've got electric cars where the price points are actually at the same point of gasoline engine cars. So the accessibility for an electric car has changed dramatically. You know, it, it used to take us years to build a million electric cars. Now we're building a million a year. So we're seeing an acceleration. I think it's becoming more top of mind. I think younger generations of investors in particular are very interested in this as they're, they, they seem to be much more focused on climate change issues. Um, they want to be part of the solution. Um, so I think, you know, we've seen a... a, a We've definitely seen a younger uh, group of investors engage with us. We've seen a very uh, a, a broader group of investors, go, you know, from specialty type of funds to more generalist funds. And you know, because some of these industries and companies are still fairly small, um, we think you know we're still at the very early stages um, of this cycle. And there's going to be a lot of companies that are going to be big winners. There's going to be companies that are going to be losers. Um, it's it's going to be volatile, and I think a lot of investors, because of that, are opting to just buy baskets of these stocks and 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 riding the thematic. Um, and I think that's where some of our ETFs have, have come into play. Absolutely, and and given the fact that we're still in the early age uh, days of this cycle, do you think you guys will be launching more products uh, within the energy transition space? Yeah, I mean, we're constantly looking at, at obviously trends um, and how new technologies are being deployed. And we're looking at uh, competitor offerings in the marketplace to see if they are in fact doing a good, a good job of providing exposure uh, to these minerals. And, you know, we often find that they're constructed by, you know, generalist kind of indexing uh, shops and ETS sponsors that don't have any real expertise in, in metals and mining. And, it's very easy for us to come up with something that we believe is more compelling because it's it's either giving you more pure play exposure uh, or a more thoughtful way to index some of these these strategies. So we're we're constantly looking on the horizon. I would say one of the themes for us in the next 12 months is going to be copper. Um, we have a very long-term bullish view on copper. It's a very big market. I think institutional investors are going to gravitate to copper because it's very large, established, and liquid. Um, unlike some of these other metals, which are still earlier stage in their development, um, they're more volatile as a result. And copper is something that I think is, is just uh, more, more understood by institutional investors. So we're, we've definitely got a few things in our, in our pipeline related to, to copper specifically. Well, we look forward to seeing that come out the pipeline. John, thank you so much for spending time with us today and sharing your insights.
Yeah, thank you for having me. Nice to see you again.